when COVID started, I started listening to podcasts about birds. It's just kind of relaxing. And I came across the casual birder and it's just a wonderful podcast. And especially I like it when I'm driving because she's got such a calming voice and just talks about birds in just a beautiful way. And it just really helps me de-stress. Plus I, I learn about the lovely birds that they have over there and other places she visits. So I'm going to let Susie start sharing her screen and she's going to do the first part of her program is recorded because it is after midnight there now. <laughs> She's so gracious to come on our program. And then she will answer your questions at the end. So do you know you can type your questions in any time or wait till the end and then Susie will be gracious to answer them. Okay, Susie, you can share your screen when you're ready. I'm Susie Buttress, the host and producer of the Casual Birder podcast, a show that encourages people to take more notice of the wild birds around them. In my talk, I'll explain why I call myself a casual birder. I'll share the birds I saw during a wonderful day's birding in Baja, California, some that visited the garden of the casita where we were staying, and others I found while wandering on the beach. Of course, this is just a roundabout way for me to show you my holiday snaps, but I hope you'll enjoy seeing and hearing the birds I encountered as much as I did. Then I'll take you to one of my favourite local birding locations, the Grounds of the Vine, a mansion that was once a Tudor palace. I'll show you my typical path around the grounds, and the birds I'm likely to see there. While they may not be as exotic as the Mexican birds, they are ones I see most frequently, and I still find joy in watching them. Finally, I'll speak very briefly about my podcast before taking questions at the end. I've always been drawn to birds, and I love sharing their beauty with others. I describe myself as a casual birder. My birding style is gentle and, I guess, a little lazy. I love to see whatever birds are around, wherever I am. My favourite birding day would be one where I'm in a location where there are likely to be a variety of bird species, and I'll just sit and watch what arrives. Birds are interwoven with my day-to-day -day living. They feel a big part of my life, and I'm always looking or listening for them, even while I work or do household chores. And whenever I go out walking, birds are the focus for me. Watching birds helps me to pause de-stress and appreciate the natural world. My vacations and weekends are the times when I can fully focus on birds. One of the most favourite things to do on vacation is to wake up before dawn and sit quietly watching the daybreak, seeing light come into the world and daytime birds become active. Sunrise is such an exciting time with the promise of all the wonders of a new day. These photos remind me of the times when I've been in fabulous locations and witnessed the natural world waking up. I like to start from the pre-dawn, when the sky is still dark and the stars are visible. I sit, watch and listen. The first birds of the morning start calling out. I notice the changes that happen as the sky lightens, shapes become visible and more defined. The stars slowly disappear and the eastern horizon begins to glow. Early birds start moving around the garden. In the UK, these might be European robins or Eurasian blackbirds. In other locations, I may not know the species, but seeing their silhouettes will start me on a contemplation of what they might be. I feel such an inner peace while I watch darkness fade and the colours of the dawn intensify. As daylight increases, more and more birds call out or sing. Just listening to different birds joining the dawn chorus can be totally absorbing. Once full daylight arrives and the songs and calls have diminished a little, I continue watching. There's excitement as I see more birds arrive, giving me the opportunity to observe their behaviours and interactions and maybe identify the species. Watching daybreak while on vacation, listening to the birds, provides me with wonderful memories to draw upon later. Of course, when I'm home, I notice the daybreak too, and the skies can be absolutely amazing. It's just not as exciting when you have to get up for work. But I still listen out for the birds that are calling out in the mornings. And I enjoy the songs of blackbirds, robins, and, at the moment, a song thrush, which wake me each day. Sometimes when I wake before dawn in a new area, 
There's so much to see and hear that I become fully engrossed and what starts out as a couple of hours birding in the morning becomes a full day. That's what happened on my first day here in Cabo Pulmo. In 2019, I had a fabulous vacation, which started with a 10-day whale-watching cruise with filmmaker and conservationist Mark Carbodine, sailing from San Diego to Cabo San Lucas in Baja, California. My husband and I then spent a week staying in two locations there. Our first three days were spent in Cabo Pulmo, staying in a little casita set in mature gardens. We were only a short walk from the sea, but that first morning I just wanted to experience the sights and sounds of the birds coming to the garden, especially when I realised there were several bird baths set out, which would likely attract them for bathing and drinking. This will give you a flavour of the sounds we heard when we arrived. You may be familiar with some of those birds. For me, however, they were quite exotic. I couldn't wait for the first birds to appear. I didn't really do any research on what birds I might see there. I wasn't as familiar with eBird at the time and didn't know that I could have used it to find out what birds were likely in the area at that time of the year. So for this day, I just discovered the birds for myself and enjoyed watching and listening to them. Using my knowledge of birds from back home and on my travels elsewhere, I tried to narrow down the species I was seeing on my bird app. I used iBird Pro and I supplemented that with Google searches. One of the first birds I saw when I arrived was the white-winged dove. I'd first seen these a year earlier in the Los Angeles area. Their look reminded me very much of the wood pigeons I see at home, but their mannerisms were much more like a collared dove, much more slender and their voice was similar to a collared dove as well. Another bird species that spent a lot of time in the garden was the hooded oriole. The male was just stunning, especially against a blue sky. They were taking nectar from the plants in the garden and seemed to defend certain plants from any other birds. I thought at first that the bird on the right was a female, as it had softer colouring than the male, but then I found it was an immature male. We did see females as well, less colourful than the male, more olive green all over and without a black bib. It was a surprise when I found this oriole calling. The flutey song you heard also was the call I thought the hooded oriole might make. I'd been hearing the chirping call and as the sound reminded me of a house sparrow, I was expecting to see a small finch. Later I wandered round the garden and I did in fact find that there were house sparrows there, of course because you travel halfway round the world and there will be house sparrows. I read that hooded orioles can mimic their neighbours such as Gila woodpeckers and ash-throated flycatchers so maybe they also mimic the sparrows. When I first saw this bird, I thought, oh, a warbler. Then I thought, oh, a warbler, knowing how tricky they can be to identify. This little bird was occasionally visible, but it spent so much time in the shrubs it was hard to get a good look, so I suspected I would never find out what it was. But then they started coming to the bird bath and stayed out in the open a bit more. At times, eight or more would be bathing all at once. Their bathing gave me the clue for identification. Aha, it's got an orange crown. I noticed a few of the birds coming to the bird bath had grey heads and thought I was seeing another species of warbler. However, I then read that young orange-crowned warblers have grey heads. 
That bird bath was a real focus in the garden, both for me and for the birds. I sat down a short distance away and watched and recorded what I saw and heard, which is how I was lucky enough to see a new bird emerging from the leaves. A Megillivray's warbler. These are close relatives of the morning warbler found in the east, a shy skulking bird which apparently puts it on the trophy list for many birders. And I was lucky enough to see it while just sitting in the garden. When I played the garden sounds earlier, you might remember hearing a fairly raucous bird with a gravelly sounding call. I eventually found out it was a cactus wren. At first I was just catching sight of a curved bill and a brown body amongst the leaves. I'd seen a California thrasher before and thought it might have been one of them, but I eventually saw it had spots on its body and that led me to identify the cactus wren. Its size was a surprise for me because European wrens are tiny birds and this was more like the size of our blackbird. I learned that this is the largest wren in the United States and it's the state bird of Arizona. Their call has been likened to the sound of a car engine that will not start. What do you think? One of the brightest birds that visited was the male northern cardinal. Although I'd seen photos of these birds before, and the odd fleeting glimpse of one in Brooklyn in New York, I hadn't ever had a chance to really observe them. Again, the water bath helped draw this species in. The male and female look quite different, although they share the red crest. I was surprised at how big the cardinals were. I think I was expecting them to be more like the size of a chunky sparrow. And I was delighted when I found it was the bird making the space laser pew pew calls. And the northern cardinal I found out is the state bird in seven US states, which is more than any other bird. It was lovely seeing this oriole and it was a hooded oriole and female cardinal bathing together as it gave me an opportunity to notice their relative sizes. I had hoped to see a pyroloxia while there. The female is similar to the female northern cardinal, so I was always looking for a more curved yellowish bill and red face markings, but I had to wait until later in the vacation for that sighting. At times I would hear a hard, loud, sudden call, and it felt like a very jay-like sound from my previous experiences with Blue and Stella's jays, and indeed the Eurasian jay. So I was really pleased when this bird made it to one of the bird baths, and I was able to confirm my suspicion, a California scrub jay. <coughs> Jays are such characters, and I later read that they steal from the food caches of other birds, like acorn woodpeckers, and when they cache their own food, they're careful that no other jay is watching. It might surprise you that it took me a long time to identify the bird on the left, one I'm sure you are all familiar with, as I read it's the state bird of Florida. My previous sightings of northern mockingbirds had been very fleeting, but they'd always been singing. For the three days that I was there, I didn't hear one singing at all. I often heard a tick-tick call, but I couldn't work out which bird was making that sound. Eventually, one came out into the open, and I heard it make the call and was finally able to identify it. I guess it's one of their contact calls. Overhead, there were loads of turkey vultures, I would have loved to see one land so that I could have learned more about it at rest. I've learned that they are known in some places as turkey buzzard or even just buzzard and I try to be mindful of that when I speak about our own common buzzard which is a totally different species. These vultures are extremely widespread and found from southern Canada all the way to the southern tip of South America so I hope to get an opportunity to observe these birds more on future travels. I only saw this bird this one time, although I suspect it was often singing in the garden. It's hard to identify birds from sound alone unless the call or song is very distinctive. It was quite high up on a flower spike and um, I was hand holding my camera so apologies for the shaky video. Shh. 
it was a Scots Oriole, and with such a beautiful song. As it was only a fleeting glimpse, I was very pleased to have captured the video for later identification. Apparently, they're one of the first birds to start singing each day, starting before sunrise. So if I lived there, I'd definitely become more familiar with them. And I've read that they're one of the few birds to eat monarch butterflies, because they've learned to only eat the least toxic parts. A little bit later, we did actually leave the property, because my husband convinced me to walk to the beach, where he had early, earlier seen a variety of species. On the way, we saw a verdin and Costa's hummingbird. I saw my first verdin when we were on the whale watching trip. It's another bird that makes a lot of tick noises. I soon learned to recognise them because apart from the bright head, it has a red plumage mark on its shoulder. They don't always sit out in full view, often they're jumping through the scrub, and so you have to try and catch the various plumage elements to work out what it is. The Costa's hummingbird was beautiful. I really love seeing hummingbirds, as it's a species we don't have on this side of the Atlantic. It had these spectacular long plumes on its throat area, but it was so difficult to take a photograph of this bird, it kept the sun behind it, which meant its head looked black most of the time, and for a fraction of a second it would flash purple, and then it would be black again. The beach was absolutely delightful. Really beautiful blue water and sky, silky sand and exciting birds. There was an American kestrel on the dunes by the beach, lots of brown pelicans and some waders. I was extremely happy to see this osprey hunting along the beach. It's a bird that we get here, but you generally have to go to specific places to see them. In this photo, I felt it was looking directly at me. I found it extremely challenging to get a photograph with the lighting conditions, but it didn't stop me trying. I'd love to have seen it flying with its prey as it aligns the fish so it's head first to reduce wind resistance. They are a widespread species found on all continents except Antarctica, so I might have another opportunity for that. There were lots of brown pelicans resting on rocks on the beach. It was fabulous to get closer looks at these large, unusual birds. We'd seen lots of them flying while we were on the whale tour, but this was a lovely opportunity to see them close by. We were able to watch them diving for fish, surprisingly close to the shore where it seemed quite shallow. I was really interested in watching them dive. I've seen northern gannets diving for fish where they fold back their wings and become like a dart entering the water. The pelicans seemed a little ungainly entering the water. They kind of corkscrew at the end of the dive. But I learned they rotate their body to the left to help protect the trachea and esophagus, which are on the right side of the neck. And it works because they were catching fish. The last bird we saw on the beach was the spotted sandpiper. I struggle with identifying waders, though I'm getting better. But this was behaving in a very distinctive way, bobbing its tail up and down and running up and down the surf. I've read that spotted sandpipers are the most widespread breeding sandpiper in North America, and that if they're not going to be breeding, they remain this colour, whereas the breeding spotted sandpipers indeed have very spotted plumage. On the way back to the casita, we came across a Gila woodpecker and common ground dove. On the whale watching trip, several of the other passengers had seen Gila woodpeckers on the islands we visited. I always seemed to miss those sightings, so I was delighted when I saw them here. I read that they create nest holes in saguaro cactus, which afterwards are reused by birds such as cactus wren, American kestrel and elf owl. I wish I'd known that because I would have taken more notice of the holes I saw and maybe found some other birds. The common ground dove was tiny, similar in size to a song sparrow, with a scaly looking breast. I saw two of them in the garden of the casita the following morning, engaging in courtship behaviour, which I tried to video, but the light levels were just too poor. So I had to just watch and enjoy the moment instead. And so now we leave Cabo Pormo behind, and I'll take you on a walk through one of my favourite local sites for birds. The Vine is certainly a very attractive house, transformed from a cluster of medieval buildings into a Tudor palace and home to lords and ladies for over five centuries. It was bequeathed to the National Trust in the 1950s. I'll tell you a secret. I've never been inside because I love seeing the birds outside so much. I suppose I'll have to go inside one day. The Vine is midway between London and Southampton 
and within 10 kilometres of my house. I mention that because I'm taking part in the local Big Year Challenge. Choose a 10 kilometre radius to bird and record all the species you can find in a year in that radius. As the vine is one of my go-to places to bird locally, it's perfect. It has all these habitats in one location. Did I mention that I'm a lazy birder? So there's quite a variety here. There's a lake, which you may be able to see on the satellite photo, views over grazing fields from the lakeside path, a walled garden and other ornamental garden sections, a marshy area overlooked by a bird hide and lovely woodland walks. Oh, and it has a great cafe and restrooms. Very important when you're out for the day. There's something interesting to see through all seasons. There'll likely be mute swans resting on the lawn, maybe some moorhens wandering around as well. And in the summer, you can hire deck chairs and children play or picnic. There are always ducks on the lake. When I first started coming, I assumed they were all mallards. But as you'll see, there's quite a variety of species when you look closer. The summer house is part of the formal garden area and a very handy shelter should it start to rain when you arrive. I always start my walk in the walled garden. Here there are a variety of flower beds and some devoted to vegetables. Typical garden species are often found here and some larger birds. I'll often see a red kite flying over, seemingly to fly in a very laid back way using its tail as a rudder. At one time these birds were confined to Wales because of persecution, but a successful reintroduction programme in England and Scotland has found them spreading widely. When I first moved to my house 20 years ago, you had to travel long distances in the hopes of seeing them. Now I can watch them from my office window almost every day. Britain's favourite bird, regularly coming top of poles and very much associated with winter festivals, the European robin is a very familiar sight to gardeners. They're known to become tame when there are regular offerings of freshly dug up worms. They're quite different from the American robin, which are named for a similar red breast. Male and female robins look alike, and while they seem cute, they can be very aggressive to others intruding on their territory. The males sing all year, with a thinner, more melancholy sounding song in the winter months, like this. These little birds have colonised other countries, as I'm sure you know, but here in England, house sparrow numbers have had a serious decline. I'm always delighted to see them hopping on the ground, finding crumbs or dust bathing in shallow dips in the soil. And I love their chirps. One of my favourite birds, the acrobatic blue tit, is a familiar visitor to garden bird feeders. They also nest readily in the boxes that we put up. With such bright colouring, they draw attention and I love watching them make their way along branches looking for insects or seeds. This one sounds angered or agitated by something. In fact, they're often one of the first species to alert others to danger, whether a ground-based or flying predator, and I've noticed other birds react to a blue tit's warning. The Eurasian blackbird is in the same genus as the American robin, and you can see similarities in the shape and demeanour, if not the colour. Blackbirds have a beautiful song and are the sound of warm sunny days in the garden to me. On my trips, I'll leave the walled garden behind and walk alongside the lake. There are a variety of water birds here, the ones that are most tolerant of people. Some, like the mallards and mute swan, will look for food from visitors. 
The mute swan is our most commonly seen swan species, found in parks and wherever there's shallow, slow-flowing rivers. I'm sure you'll be familiar with mallards. These ducks seem to be found everywhere, even on the smallest park pond. They're not restricted to freshwater and can also be found at the coast. I was delighted when I first saw tufted ducks on the lake here because I'd only ever seen them in the distance before, but here you can get relatively close, certainly enough to appreciate the beautiful purplish heads of the males. I don't think they're as tolerant of people as the mallards, which makes seeing them this closely all the more enjoyable. We have a resident population of tufted ducks, but numbers are boosted in the winter by birds migrating from Iceland and northern Europe. They are the same genus as the ring-necked ducks, which I believe you have there. I always see little grebes on the lake, and in fact, although they're hard to observe, I've learned the most about them by watching them here. They are infuriating, as they seem to spend most of their time below water before popping up for air. As soon as you spot them and get your binoculars on them, they're gone again. This one had caught a fish, so I was actually able to photograph it. The Eurasian coot is very similar to the American coot, and this wetland bird eats vegetation in the water along with some insects. They can be quite aggressive to others, especially during the breeding season. They're mainly seen on freshwater. I've only become aware of gadwall in recent years and have appreciated being able to see them so closely here at the vine. The male has very striking markings when seen close up, and I'm sure it's overlooked by many people. I will admit that I've probably mistaken female gadwalls for female mallards. I recently learned to look at the bill markings. The gadwall has a neat dark line down the middle of the bill, whereas the mallard has blotches spreading over the bill. Alongside the lake and looking across the grazing fields with the lake at the back, I see birds associated with farmlands, but that can also be seen in gardens. The common buzzard won't be in our gardens, but might fly over if we're lucky. They're in the same genus as red-tailed hawk and red-shouldered hawk. They're very variable in colour, and when soaring, can make novice birders think they've seen an eagle. Actually, some casual birders have been mistaken on that part too. The next three birds are all members of the crow family. Rooks are often found walking across farm fields in large numbers, looking for grubs and seed in the soil. They're also found in parks and gardens. They live in large rookeries and their calls when roosting can be deafening. Over the past few years, a rook has become friendly towards me, so I've been able to observe them at fairly close quarters, and that's led to me having quite a soft spot for these large birds. Jackdaws are our smallest crow and associate with rooks. They are very striking birds with their pale eyes and silver napes, and they get their name from their call. Which sounds like they're saying chack, chack. The common magpie is a noisy black and white bird that's equally at home in woodlands and fields as it is in our gardens. Although this view shows the black and white plumage, the back and tail has iridescent feathers showing purplish blue on the wings and greenish purple on the tail in the sunlight. Very intelligent and curious, they get up to all sorts of mischief, like the three juveniles who kept pulling the pegs off my washing line one summer. Wood pigeons are a bird of the countryside that's made its way into our towns and gardens in recent years, where they've become tolerant of humans. They appear to be big lumbering birds, but are surprisingly agile when feeding from shrubs, balancing on little twigs to get to the the best berries. Past the lake in the field, the next stop is the hide overlooking a wetland pool. Here we can see three grey herons standing around the pool. They're in the same genus as the great blue heron and look very similar. To see the water birds from this hide, you really do need binoculars or a telescope. The birds can be frustratingly far away. However, from the birds' point of view, I'm sure they prefer it. 
you might just be able to see teal on the lake there. And this is one of my favourite ducks. It's only recently that I've been able to see close-up views, but they are so beautiful. Similar to the green-winged teal found in America, but with a horizontal pale line on their wing compared to the vertical pale line of the American species. And I love when you see them close up, they've got, I think it's called vermiculated colouring, where you've got all the little patterns on the side. Just gorgeous. The northern shoveler is another surface feeding duck I've seen at the vine, usually in winter. Another very striking duck with a very wide flat bill, but often too far away to view comfortably. I believe that they are also found in the western US, so it's possible that you might have seen some as well. The northern lapwing is also known as a peewit because that's what their call sounds like. When seen at a distance and in flight, they look black and white. Indeed, a large flock that seems to flicker black and white as they fly. But close up and with the sun on them, they have gorgeous green plumage. They're in decline in the UK, likely from habitat loss. So it's a real treat to see them at the vine. I've seen grey leg geese a few times here, usually in the winter months. Grey leg geese are the largest of our native geese and they're often found in parks where they can become tame-ish, but they will hiss at you if they don't get fed. On a recent visit, we spotted this leucistic individual amongst the group. It lacks dark pigment, so the plumage appears very pale, but it is still a grey lag goose. The final part of our tour takes us to Morgaston Wood. Our largest tit is seen in woodland, as well as at garden feeders. The great tit has a two-syllable song that sounds like teacher, teacher. They can be aggressive towards smaller tits during the breeding season, but in winter form parts of large roaming mixed flocks that it's worth listening out for, as you may find other tit species, nut hatches and gold crests travelling with them. These pretty little birds look like flying lollipops, They forage in groups of about 20, keeping in touch with contact calls and high-pitched song. They're very restless feeders, seemingly always on the move. This makes them hard to count, although when one long-tailed tit flies off to a different tree, they tend to follow in a line. So if you see the first one leave, you can usually count most of them as they follow. We have two species of black and white woodpeckers in the UK, the great spotted and the lesser spotted. I've seen both in these woods, although the lesser spotted only once, and I'm always searching to see it again, as it's the less common of the two species. The great spotted woodpecker can be detected by its loud call, or drumming in the breeding season. The chiff chaff is so named because of its song, which sounds like it's saying, chiff chaff. It's quite hard to tell these apart from the similar willow warbler, especially when they're often high up in the leafy canopy. But luckily, the chiff-chaff says chiff-chaff, and the willow warbler has a different song altogether. They eat insects from the foliage, and sometimes fly out to grab one in the air, shutting the bill with a surprisingly loud snap for such a small bird. Another small bird that makes loud noises, the wren, It has a very loud voice. I've actually turned that down because when it was played at full volume, I think it would have just burst your eardrums. It's one of the wonderful sounds of the late spring woodland though. Wrens are not limited to woodland and can be found in parks and gardens, creeping around the bottoms of shrubs in a mouse-like manner. The dunnock is often overlooked as it forages for food below shrubs as well and around the scrub margins and because it's dark greys and blues it gets hidden in the shadows. In the spring it sings loudly from prominent perches. It has a very complex social life and according to birds of the world it has every mating system known in passerines in a single species. I'll leave you to look into that further if you're intrigued. I'll leave you with a little song from the woodland in spring.
hopefully you heard the blackbird singing in there as well as I think one wren. So I just want to tell you briefly about the Casual Birder podcast. If you'd like to hear more about the walks that I spoke about today, the bird walk at the Vine and sitting in the backyard in Baja, California, listening to the birds, I actually recorded a couple of episodes just there and these ones in particular you might want to listen to. And in the one in Baja, California, I was recording it while I was noticing the birds and that was when the cactus wren turned up and I was delighted and you'll hear that in the episode. If you'd like to follow me online, these are all my contact details, but you can just go to casualbirder.com where you can hear the podcast and all my links are there as well. Thank you very much for listening and do you have any questions? Okay, so at this point you can type them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and Susie, that was just delightful. I just feel like I went on a trip to different places and just really enjoying the birds thank you it was really hard to keep it to the time scale i had so much i wanted to say you did good (laughs) all right susan's going to read the questions Uh, you're muted susan sorry (laughs) when did you start birding susie um well officially when I was 15 but I've loved birds ever since I was a small child so they've always formed a large part of my life Um, just you know spending time when I was a kid throwing bread out to the birds which we did then Um, but just then laying on my tummy with my hands my head in my hands looking out the window watching them I was just fascinated by them and um, Penny says great pictures Thank you. Oh, I should have just given a little bit of a credit to my husband who took some of those pictures. I should have put something somewhere. Um, but I actually took most of them, which I'm quite proud of. Very good. And Penny said, great pictures. And Laurie said, thank you very much. I did some birding in your country in the past. I've really enjoyed it. Um, Judy says, fantastic photos. Very impressed. Thank you. And Alan wants to know, what camera are you using for the videos? I'm glad you asked me that. I don't remember because I was using a different camera then, but a a lot of, um, so the the ones in Mexico, I was using a different camera. Um, I've now moved to a a Nikon P950. Um, Most of my uh, videos that you'll see now are through that, but it was a similar similar camera. It's just that one broke down on me. I think I put it through too much uh, hard work. And Bobby said it's very enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Do you have any other plans for travel? Um, well, we would like to get back out there again. It's, you know, it's been a hard time recently, but um, we, uh, we, we do hope to do some more trips. I would absolutely love to come to Florida because um, all the birds you were talking about at the beginning, I was like, oh, I've never seen one of them. I want to see one of them. Um, I would love to go back to Mexico again now that I'm sort of more aware of how I can find out about other birds that were there. I just sat and watched and waited for things to turn up. But now I could do some research beforehand. And I also have learned the value of um, hiring a guide to take me somewhere, a local guide, after a recent uh, holiday that we had in Scotland where we actually had a guide with us. So that's something I'm going to do in future as well to highlight. I mean, I'm very much a person that wants to, I don't want to be led around and I don't want to have things pointed out too much because I want to find them. So I I want a guide that will take me to a place where there'll be birds and assist me, but not, uh, not sort of do it all for me. I want to find the birds myself, but have someone who can help me find them. So that's what I'm looking for. If anyone knows anyone in any country that wants to suggest, <laughs> I'll definitely come. <laughs> definitely. Now, Deborah wanted to know, what about the storks? Well, I've never seen them. Um, we have we have breeding population now, and I'm hoping that I'll be able to get there either this year or next. Um, but unfortunately, I've, I've not seen them, so I can't really say very much about them. And Laura Taylor said, very inspiring, and she loved the education. Thank you. Ellen said, we would definitely um, help show you around if you come to or, oh, this area in Central Florida. I saw all those trips that you've got coming up, and I was thinking, <laughs> yeah. only I was closer. Oh, we well, always have trips. 
alligators. I can do without those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. We do have some great birds here. Mm-hmm. So how so long have you been doing your podcast, Susie? I uh, started it at the end of 2017, so um, over four years now. Wow. Um, it's just podcasting is a passion of mine. I'm, I'm a very big podcast listener. And gradually I decided I'd like to try doing one myself. And I wanted to, I mean, it was great. It meant I could combine my two passions, you know, birding and podcasting. Um, it's really become a massive, massive part of my life now, which, I mean, it takes a long time to create an episode, but um, it's put me in touch with so many fantastic people. And it's actually made me a better birder because I'm conscious of trying to um, bring birds to people. It makes me look at them differently, think about how I can describe them, think how I can explain the joy I get from seeing them. And um, I think, yeah, I think it has made me a better birder. That's wonderful. And if people listen to your podcast, I guess in May, you'll do another global birding team that because I I actually joined that team this year. And it was so much fun because we were working with people from around the world to see how many species we could see and raise money for conservation. That was really a really neat experience. It's really thrilled me how many people have actually taken part. And it's so exciting to see what birds people are seeing and you know having someone in Australia who can start the day for us before we've even woken up and and already see what species are coming in and then all through Europe and then into America and into the west coast it's just um yeah it's a really lovely way to us all feel part of one team and share the birds that we're seeing so yeah that's a we'll definitely be doing that again in May nice nice and Sandra Blee says delightful program thank you I think that's my sister. And I think she has birded a little bit in um, the UK because her husband is from there. So any favorite birds, Sandra, do let us know. I I do sometimes feel because I always want to be mindful that sometimes I can only see the birds that are very local to me. And you can sometimes feel a little bit like you're overlooking them because you see them all the time. So I'm always trying to be mindful of them and look for differences or look for something in their behaviour that can give me a spark. And there's always something. But then, you know, when I go travelling or when I see other people's birds, I'm sort of left thinking, why don't I have those birds here? They're so interesting. <laughs> They're so exciting. Um, but I have to keep remembering that, you know, even even the lowly little dunnock has a, you know, extraordinary mating life and you know there's there's things you can discover by watching and listening and just taking it slow um i think that's a really key thing for me so very true Mm -hmm. very good and she sandra said she birded the north of hull on the coast and had a lot of fun challenging birding though because if it's anything like me I have real struggles with wading birds and water birds and especially if they're out in a an estuary or something you need a scope and um and the sheer numbers of birds when we were in Scotland this previous uh, winter um I couldn't believe how many geese I was seeing I mean it may be birds that you're familiar with because you have the migration path coming through and you mentioned earlier about your thousands of American robins but yeah. We just don't see quantities of birds like that. And so to go to somewhere where you do, it's almost too overwhelming to see if there's what species you've got there because it's just like, ah, there's birds. And uh, I think I, I respond much more to the sort of garden and woodland birds that are more approachable. Um, but I'm certainly getting a real, a real appreciation of the different types of birds around and learning the waders and learning the, the water birds that we have. Um, again, part of the podcast I think it's just making me more aware well we really appreciate it we know it's now like one o'clock right? yeah, so and we don't want to keep you longer yeah Luckily, but... I don't work tomorrow so I could just oh, <laughs> that's good <laughs> that's good but if you're like most of us birders you'll be up anyways to listen to the birds and yes see I know I know <laughs> there's no that's sleeping in anymore that's okay well, this is wonderful. And um, everyone, if, if it went too fast for you, um, we'll have it recorded shortly. 
Um, I do see one more question coming in, even though my clock's going off. So Susan will ask Judy um, asked, do you have a science background? Um, well, I do, but not in any of the natural sciences. So I've got a psychology background, but um, yeah, everything that I've learned is, is kind of like self-taught or um, just from reading or observing, which is why I, I sort of make it plain that I'm a casual birder and not an expert because I'll talk about the birds in my own words and the observations will be the things that I've observed. Um, one of the really nice things about the show is that I do have lots of commentary from people around the world and from other people who are experts. So it gives a good mix. But for my own, um, my own observations are, I try to make them as factual as possible. There will sometimes be little stories that creep in, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's only from what I've read or what I've learned or what I've observed. So I try to do it in a factual way that's hopefully entertaining, but it's not from a science educator uh, point of view. Oh, so now do you get some of your patients to um, bird? Because I know it's very relaxing. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> what, what's your next podcast going to be about that you're working on? Well, the one that is actually late because I've been working on this talk Thank <laughs> is, you. is the one that should have been out uh, about a week or so ago, which is about what's coming up in 2022 for us all. But then I'm really excited because the one after that is a trip report that another podcaster did. Um, down to Belize and she's given me a trip report about the birds she saw there and I'm, I'm going to be putting that out and I'm going to start a new series actually of talk, asking people to give me either an interview or to tell me about places that they've been because I think it's really nice for people to learn about other locations um, either because they might plan to go there if they know what birds they can see or just to dream about it really. Um, I'd never considered going to Belize and this it sounded fantastic so I'm really looking forward to getting that episode out as well and hopefully people enjoy that. We will enjoy that for sure. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay well we're going to let Susie go so she <laughs> can get some she sleep. Can call it a night but this has been a wonderful program and I just um, <laughs> really look forward to maybe going to UK someday and seeing those. Yeah. And, and Deborah does say she, there is a guide that we can put you in touch with in Belize that he's come to our festival. <laughs> Yes, Glenn Crawford of Wildside Tours. He was oh, amazing. Right. He was a okay. really good birder. So maybe you can come to our festival that. next year. Oh, yeah. That so, would be fantastic. Yes. yes. We'll yes. get to that information. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me around. You're very welcome. With you yes, thank you very much. Thank you for yes. coming. All right. And everyone, we'll be on the Orange Audub Audubon YouTube next week with our Hummingbird program. Hi, everybody. Well, thank you for joining us, Mike. Have a Bye. good night.